In the afternoon of March 11, 2011, Japan witnessed a catastrophic event that shook the very foundations of the earth and the lives of those who call Japan a home. A massive 9.1 magnitude earthquake struck the country's east coast, wrecking buildings and creating a 40 meter tsunami, which quickly followed the destruction of the earthquake. To add to the misery, the tsunami disabled the power supply of three of the cooling systems of the Fukushima nuclear power plant, causing a meltdown. Nearly 20,000 men, women, and children died on that day. To understand the events that occurred, we must first look at the geographic area where it all unfolded. Japan, a country rich with cultural heritage, is located in a seismically active region known as the Pacific Ring of Fire. At the heart of this natural turmoil lies the convergence of four major tectonic plates. The Pacific Plate, the Philippine Sea Plate, the Eurasian Plate, and the North American Plate. It's a geological battleground where Earth's colossal forces are at play. Japan's geological history is marked by a series of dramatic events. Over millions of years, the collisions and seductions of these plates have shaped not only its beautiful landscape, filled with mountains and volcanoes, but its unmatched seismic volatility. No other country on Earth is as likely to experience earthquakes and tsunamis as Japan, which is why in 1981, Japan's government created a law requiring that all future homes and apartments be built to a certain standard in order to withstand even the strongest of earthquakes. For the Japanese, seismic activity is a part of daily life. However, it's also a constant reminder that preparation is essential. The nation has a sophisticated monitoring and detection system, capable of tracking even the faintest tremors. Earthquake early warning systems utilize a network of incredibly precise and sensitive seismometers to help detect the initial, less destructive primary waves. These are known as P waves. This gives people valuable seconds to take cover or to evacuate. The importance of early warning signs cannot be overstated. In Japan, drills and preparedness have become a way of life. For them, it's not a matter of if, but when. As the sun rose on March 11, 2011, Japan was about to experience one of its darkest days. The Tohoku region, located in the northeastern part of Japan's main island, was bustling with daily life. Fishing villages and coastal towns carried out with their routines, unaware of the impending catastrophe. At 2.46 p.m. local time, the Earth's tectonic plates violently shifted along a massive fault line beneath the Pacific Ocean. The magnitude 9.1 Tohoku earthquake struck with unimaginable force. The seismic waves radiated out, triggering Japan's early warning systems, giving people precious seconds to seek shelter. In the blink of an eye, the bustling streets of Tokyo and the serene countryside were in chaos. Buildings swayed, objects toppled, and panic ensued. It was a terrifying experience that lasted nearly six minutes, and it was only the beginning. The earthquake's epicenter was situated off the east coast of Japan, creating massive ruptures in the ocean floor. These ruptures displaced a vast amount of water, setting the stage for a second unprecedented disaster. Twenty minutes after the earthquake, the sea began to recede, an eerie sign that a tsunami was imminent. A tsunami, contrary to popular beliefs, isn't just a wave that is big. When an earthquake happens on the water, the massive energy release can displace huge amounts of water vertically, sending it all craning in different directions. Where the ocean floor is deep, this gives the waves plenty of space to propagate and move around, allowing for them to be barely noticeable. 
However, when they approach the coast and the ocean floor gets shallow, they slow down and the energy is forced vertically. The warning went out to coastal communities, but the magnitude of what was coming was beyond comprehension. As tsunamis approach the shore, the water begins to recede, acting as a sign of what's to come for those who didn't already receive the tsunami warnings. The closer the tsunami gets to the shore, the taller the water gets, and then, boom, it crashes. The first tsunami wave, resembling a towering wall of water, reached almost 40 meters in height and approached with an unstoppable force. It overcame the seawalls of coast communities that were built for this specific purpose and submerged entire towns in water. People ran for their lives, seeking refuge on rooftops, while others were tragically engulfed by the surging waters. When the water receded, sweeping away countless bodies, the scale of the destruction was horrific. Entire communities were reduced to rubble. We were fortunate enough to get an interview with one of the people that was in Japan during the time of the earthquake. Leslie Chan, Ethan Young's uncle. Our first question is, where were you at the time of the earthquake on March 11, 2011? What were you doing at 1446 Japan Standard Time, the time that the earthquake hit? Well, during that time, I was in Asakusa. I was living in a share house with like different country people. I'm sharing a room with a Korean American. And when I when when the day was there's an earthquake happening, I was like uh, casually was like. Uh, drawing my stuff in front of the computer, laptop, more specific. Then suddenly, like uh, my my roommate was taking a bath. Then then the the house starts shaking. Then my roommate just came back and say, "Is this earthquake? Is this earthquake?" That was very casual. He said, "Yeah, it's earthquake." So what should we do? What should we do? Said, oh come on, man! It's Japan. They always have earthquake. Relax. I was just, I was just keep drawing. It's very relaxing. Then the next room, there's a Chinese girl. Then she also came here and said, "Is this earthquake? Is this earthquake?" So I was like, "Yeah, it's earthquake. It's Japan. Come on, man. Japan's always have earthquake. Relax." And I was keep like very relaxing. Then, then, so, then they kind of, kind of panicking. I was, I was trying to relax them, and suddenly I hear like, like. Uh, the kitchen or whatever is like things start to fall off. Like you, you hear like the plate, the cup is on so on. This, this, this. Asks, what should we do? What should we do? Mm. I say it's time we go out right now. Yeah, so we go out. So is the feeling was pretty much like a. It doesn't feel like an eight. And Asakusa is feel is feeling like a four point five or five. It's not like crazy shaking. As the what the as what the news was saying. So what happened when we uh, when we know it's a very big deal is after like like in a certain time it will stop right. Even though it's an earthquake, it, it won't it won't keep shaking until like um, like whole day. It they were they were like shaking for like five to ten minutes, then it would stop for a while. Then then later there would be some kind of a. So a, a little bit, little shake here and there, kind of thing, right? So we go back to the to the house, the share house. Then we watch TV and we see like, well, Fukushima was like this huge tsunami kind of thing, flooding. I was when I watched the TV, I was like, this is not the latest movie, right? Like because I remember at that time there was a movie called 2020 or something like that. It's, it's about like like the world yen kind of story. So this is not. No, no, it's not. It's like re it's live. And, oh my god! Then they were. Then I realized there is like a huge earthquake happening in Japan. Yeah. 
Do you know if the Japanese government changed anything regarding building laws or evacuation rules after this earthquake? No, because Japan is always having earthquakes, so they always have like, like, uh, they, they, I think they're very used to have earthquakes, so they already have a system of like when earthquake happens, so you need to like hide under your desk or you, you, you go to a specific open area when, when it's really, really bad, you go to an open area, then, then you just wait until the government told you to, to do something or whatever. So, uh, I don't think they changed much of it. Because it's just like uh, the previous day of the previous experience, they know they just like like try to more alert of what happened, what what happened if this happened again. So I don't think they changed anything of the system because they kind of very used to that system right now. If we happen to be traveling in Japan during a major earthquake, what would you suggest for us to do? Yeah, just follow what the Japanese doing. Yeah, because they get so used to it, so just follow what they what what they're doing. If they are very relaxing, so like, I don't think you need to panic. Yeah, if they start to panic, then you need to start run away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for joining us on this interview. Yeah, you're welcome. Amidst the chaos and destruction, a final threat loomed. The tsunami had a catastrophic impact on the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, threatening to cause a nuclear disaster on the level of Chernobyl. The surging waters breached the plant's protective barriers and damaged critical cooling systems. What followed was a race against time to prevent a nuclear disaster. About 154,000 civilians were evacuated from the area, with around 2,300 vulnerable hospital patients dying in the evacuation. Miraculously, the evacuation was conducted in time, and there were no radiation-related deaths. 19,759 people died that day, between the earthquake and the tsunami. As the sun set on March 11, 2011, Japan was a forever changed nation. In the aftermath, Japan mobilized an extraordinary relief effort. The world watched as the Japanese people united in their grief and determination to rebuild. Australia, China, Canada, India, New Zealand, South Korea, and the United States were some of the many countries that came to provide aid for the citizens of Japan that were affected. In Japan, the event resulted in the total destruction of more than 123,000 houses and damaged almost a million more. The cost and damages resulting from the earthquake, tsunami, and the Fukushima meltdown was estimated at 220 billion US dollars, making this the single most expensive disaster in history. After the events of 2011, the Japanese government wanted to better protect their residents. So shortly following the tsunami, they commissioned the construction of a much taller and wider seawall. A massive 400 kilometer long and up to 12 meter tall concrete wall was constructed, costing over 6.8 billion US dollars. The residents of Fukushima and various other Japanese towns believe that the walls are an eyesore and a disturbance to their lifestyle, and that the walls will draw away any potential tourists from the town. However, the trade-off is immeasurable, and the Japanese government is confident it will be able to protect against future tsunamis. If you're watching this documentary shortly after it was released, that means it's been around 12 years since the disaster initially happened. So in that time, has Japan effectively prepared for when something like this inevitably happens again? The answer is, probably.